Well, good afternoon and happy Sabbath to you all. Um, I also wish everyone who's tuned in on the webcast uh, here in Australia and around the world a happy Sabbath as well. Well, the last time I spoke here, I covered the first commandment that tells us not to worship any other God but the true God. Now, today's message in the series on the Ten Commandments, I'd like to take a look at the second commandment now. Now, the second commandment is given to us in verses 4 to 6 of Exodus 20, where God commands the following. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or is that, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the heaven or the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor shall you serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. So we see here we are not to worship before images or representations of any god, be they the false gods or as aids to worship in our worship of the true god. Now Albert Barnes in his commentary notes, as the first commandment forbids the worship of any false god, seen or unseen, it is here forbidden to worship an image of any sort, whether the figure of a false deity or one in any way symbolic of Yahweh, end of quote. Now God goes on here to say that he is a jealous God. Now God has a deep feeling of intolerance, hurt and even anger when his people are unfaithful to him and a zeal not to lose that exclusive devotion that we are to have for him. Now, godly jealousy is a protective jealousy to protect others from what is harmful. Now, God knows that when we put others or other things before him, we will get hurt and we will lose out on what he can offer us. Now, commenting on the expression visiting the, the iniquity of the fathers upon the, the children to the third and fourth generation, Albert Barnes in his commentary says, sons and remote descendants inherit the consequences of their father's sins in disease, poverty, captivity, with all the influences of bad example and evil communications, end of quote. Now, when we look at the focus of each of the first three commandments, we see that the first commandment addresses the issue of who or what we worship. The second commandment addresses the manner in which we worship. It addresses the issue of using physical aids to worship. And the third commandment, which we'll look at in the next message, also addresses the manner in which we worship, but focuses instead on our words and the manner in which we represent God. Now, there are several statutes in the Torah that further expand on the second commandment. Now in Exodus 20 verse 23, God told Israel not to make anything to be with him like gods of silver or gold. In Deuteronomy 4, God reminded the Israelites that they saw no form when he spoke the Ten Commandments. Now this doesn't mean that God has no form as we are made in his image and likeness. Now God simply did not want them to see his form in case they acted on their own carnal impulses to copy and make a representation of him. Now God also told them not to make carved images that look like any animals, birds, insects, fish, or worship the sun, moon, and stars and planets, which the other nations around them were all doing with their worship of false gods in the form of animals, insects, fish, and birds. Now, when they entered the promised land, they were also told in Numbers 33, 52, not only to drive out the inhabitants of the land, but also to do three other things. Destroy all their pictures, destroy all their metal images, and break down all their high places where they worshipped. Now, it didn't take long for Israel to break the second commandment when Moses went back up to Mount Sinai for quite a long while. Now, in their impatience, they coerced Aaron to make a god to go before them. Now, they wanted a form they could see and allow them to feel connected with the god that could take them into the promised land. 
Now, in a documentary called Demons by Dr. Michael Heiser, he says, an ancient person would build an idol. And they're not idiots. They know that they just built that. The idea wasn't that the idea wasn't that this was my deity. The idea is that I would build this object as a home for a spiritual entity. And this entity would somehow attach itself to this object, end of quote. Now we see here in Exodus 32 that the people said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now they saw the idol as representative of the true God the God that had just brought them out of Egypt and celebrated their own feast to the Lord. Now, God, however, did not see it that way. In verse 8, God said, They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves an idol, a molded calf, and worshipped it and sacrificed to it. Now, notice he says they have worshipped it, not me. Now, King Jeroboam I repeated the same mistake when the northern kingdom split off from Judah a few centuries later. He even used the same line when he set up two golden calves in Dan and Bethel, saying, Behold the Elohim, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, the saddest part of the story is that the people on the whole bought into the state-sanctioned religion despite what they should have remembered from their own history back at Mount Sinai. Now, from soon after they settled the land, right up to the Jewish exile, the Israelites were drawn to the pagan gods of the nations around them. Now, why were they so attracted to the pagan gods? Now, in his Ambassador College lecture series on ancient Israel, Richard Page outlined a number of the reasons for they were so drawn to them. Now, there was both the carrot and the stick reasons for why they worshipped the pagan gods. Now, in relation to superstition and fear, the Israelites did not want to incur the wrath of what they perceived to be the local gods of the land of Canaan. That was the stick. Now, one thing that was the carrot was the free sexual immorality from the temple prostitutes that they went, that went along with the pagan worship, which God detested as it corrupted marital relations and family life in Israel. Now, the next three reasons on this list here are things which can be a problem with our own relationship with the true God and the manner in which we worship and relate to him, which is what the second commandment deals with. Now, the first is that the Israelites wanted to see their gods. Now, the ancient peoples carved idols that they could see and allowed them to feel connected with a power behind the idol that they could not see. Now, rather than use images and statues to make us feel connected with the true God, we are to worship God in spirit, as Jesus says in John 4, 24. Now, this takes walking by faith in an invisible God rather than walking by sight, which is our natural human tendency. Now, the next reason the Israelites are attracted to the pagan gods is something that historians call sympathetic magic. Now, temple prostitution was based on this idea of sympathetic magic. By having sex with a temple prostitute, it was thought that this ritual would compel Baal and Astarte to mate in the heavens and cause fertility to come upon the land. Now, the most extreme example of this sympathetic magic was sacrificing their own firstborn children to the gods. Now, by burning their baby sons and daughters, they felt that this ritual would compel the gods to give them what they wanted most. Kind of like rubbing a genie's lamp, they thought they could get the god to give them a wish by giving up what they valued most in doing this detestable act. Now, we have to be careful of this attitude of sympathetic magic in our own relationship with God, where we try and compel God to do our bidding by doing things and feel like God owes us in return. Now, all that we have comes from his grace and mercy, though we can have confidence in his promises to provide for us. Now, the last point on this list here is putting ritual over relationship, or put another way, putting form over substance. 
Now, this is the lazy and selfish approach that thinks, well, if I just do these token rituals, then I'll be okay with God. Now, we see this in mainstream Christianity where people feel that if they do certain token rituals, such as going to Mass or church on Christmas and Easter, that they're okay with God or they live carnal lives with no regard to God and his law for the rest of the week or the year. Now, God is looking for a change of heart and a change in, a, in our ways from sin to righteousness, not token rituals. Now, battling our human nature and bringing our lives into harmony with the way of righteousness takes hard work, and that's even with the help and power of God. Now, all that was needed in the worship of the pagan gods were token rituals, not a change of heart and lifestyle. Now, after the exile to Babylon, the Jews became very strict in their rejection of idol worship. Now, archaeologists have confirmed the lack of idols after their exile to Babylon, and geometric patterns rather than any living creatures dominated their art. Now, Albert Ebelshine writes that there were no local artists who could make a statue in Jerusalem for Emperor Caligula, as the, and the work had to then be outsourced to the Phoenicians. Now, the Worldwide Church of God reprint article, Is It Wrong to Have Pictures of Christ?, has some fascinating history showing the changing views on the use of images of Christ in mainstream Christianity. Now, the article notes that the Catholic bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius, to the sister of Const Constantine in 326 AD, wrote, And since you have written about any supposed likeness or other of Christ, what and what kind of likeness of Christ is there? Such images are forbidden by the second commandment. They are not to be found in churches and are forbidden amongst Christians. End quote. Farah also records that Irenaeus, Clement, Origen, Lactanius, all of whom were high-ranking Catholic officials, sternly condemned the use of pictures of Christ in any fashion. And Irenaeus and Clement distinctly appeal to the second commandment as authority. Now, as strong paganistic influences entered the Catholic Church, however, a council of Catholic leaders was called in Constantinople in 691 AD, in which they officially sanctioned the use of images and pictures in churches. There were some bish bishops descending from this form of idolatry, but the majority uh, carried and the decree was passed. Now, it was not until another council of Constantinople in 842 AD that the last vestiges of opposition to images and pictures were stamped out. And from that time until the present, most of Christianity has sanctioned images and the like in its churches." End of quote. Now, pictures and statues of Christ, as well as Mary, along with the use of crucifixes, are all common aids to worship in many mainstream churches today. Now, in, East, in Eastern Orthodoxy, the use of beautifully gilded images of Christ and saints is also very much a central part of their worship. Now what is interesting to note is that the very few early images of Christ differed significantly from the later commonly accepted appearance of Jesus. Now Roderick Dunkley in his book Beyond the Gospels says, in particular there is a painting of the resurrection of Lazarus in which Christ is shown youthful and beardless with short hair and large eyes. This picture is of great interest since it is the oldest representation of Jesus that is preserved anywhere. Now, Pharaoh says, during the first 400 years, there is probably no representation of Christ as bearded or as a worn and weary sufferer. Now, Dunkley also agrees with this deduction where he states, it is not until the fourth century after Christ that the familiar bearded face appears. End of quote. Now, both Farah and Dunkley intimate that the later look that has been commonly accepted came in via the pagan converts when Christianity became the state-sanctioned religion of the Roman Empire. Now, they cite similarities with pagan gods such as Apollo and Orpheus. Now, what has probably done more than anything else to solidify the commonly accepted appearance of Jesus Christ in mainstream Christianity is the relic known as the Shroud of Turin. 
Now, any discussion on the authenticity of the shroud should factor in two key biblical verses. Now, the shroud shows a man with long hair, yet the Apostle Paul, who saw and spoke with Jesus in vision in 1 Corinthians 11.14, says, Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonour to him? Now, in discussing the man of sin, or lawless one, the false prophet of the book of Revelation, Paul also wrote in 2 Thessalonians 2.9 that Satan gives him the power to work signs and lying or deceptive wonders. Now, we have to remember, just because something occurs that is supernatural or is miraculously created doesn't automatically mean that it is from God. Now, if you remember when Moses' rod turned into a serpent, the Egyptian magicians were able to mimic that act. And the Apostle Paul, in his first apostle, so first epistle, tells us very much to test the spirits. A United Church of God booklet on the Ten Commandments makes these comments about the Second Commandment. Our Creator is a living God, not an inanimate statue, figurine or picture. To make any representation of him distorts and limits our perception of what he is really like, and so damages our relationship with him. Now, Jesus made this clear when he said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, John 4, 24. We are not to worship God with images and meaningless rituals, end of quote. Now, in addition to worshipping God in spirit without images or other aids, we are to worship God in truth. Now, when I covered the first commandment, I touched on the major festivals of Christmas and Easter, which are a blend of pagan customs and Christian ideas. We are to hold the truth and reject false doctrines and practices. So, in conclusion... The letter of the law of the second commandment is that we are not to worship before images or representations of any god, be they false gods or as worship, aids to worship of the true God. And the spirit of the law of the second commandment is to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now this includes not deviating from the instructions and manner by which God tells us to worship him. In other words, don't take away or add from him as he says in Deuteronomy 4.2. And it also includes following the true teachings of the Bible and rejecting false doctrines. So let us all truly worship our great God in both spirit and in truth.